Okay. So, today we do hearing. And um, again, hearing, you, you know, don't, sort of don't notice it and you sort of sense that maybe it's not that important. But so you have to imagine yourself without any hearing. And so the one good way to imagine yourself is being at, um, you know, your family dinner and sitting there and not being able to tell what, what any part of the conversation is. Um, that's a, a difficult situation to be in. Um, so it, 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 uh, it, it, it can have um, very severe effects. The other thing is that, that children, when, the, when they're mis early, when they're growing up and they have a hearing difficulty, they're often misdiagnosed as someone with a learning impediment of some kind and all they need is some assistance in hearing, if that's possible. And of course, the, 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 the sounds that you hear when you're walking down the street can save your life. And these days with so many cell phones, and people walking around campus prevents you from bumping into people along the way. And I don't know, maybe later in life you'll have something called tinnitus, which is a ringing of the ear. And you, you, sometimes you might all also hear this sort of a, a, a faint humming in your ear. Um, older people that tends to get louder and uh, can drive you crazy. So what is sound? Okay, so here we have a speaker and here we have an eardrum. And let's Turn on the speaker, I hope. Why is this changing? Here we go. You can see the sound waves. And the only time you heard sound was after the sound hit the eardrum, okay? Because, you know, sound traveling in air, um, it, 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 you can't hear it until it activates um, act electrons in somebody's head. But what you saw was, was these pressure waves. So every time the speaker pushed, it compresses the air. It's those compressions in the air that cause the eardrum to vibrate and then the activity to occur inside your head. So let's see how this happens. You can see uh, here was two sounds, one loud and the other soft. Okay, and all that means is that this, this speaker here is vibrating more for the loud sound, producing large compressions in the air, and that was depicted by a larger um, compression on this trace or smaller comp displacements of this speaker and smaller um, compressions of the air, which in turn produce smaller movements on this eardrum. The other thing that can be different is different frequencies. So you saw that one caused a rapid, was produced by a rapid vibration of the speaker and the other was produced by a slower vibration of the speaker. Now, this, these speakers can vibrate anywhere from 20 times a second to 20,000 times a second. And with most of your young years can hear that. Okay. As you get older, this, this, this starts to compress. And uh, um, I've heard that some students can um, ramp the, the speakers on their iPhones to very high frequencies and be able to chat with each other during the exam and have older professors not notice any of that chatter <laughs> happening. Um, I'm not suggesting this in any way. But uh, 
you're very sensitive to frequencies between 2,000 and 4,000. And these are the frequencies which most spoken words occur at. Now, when um, the ear, the, the, the sound goes down your ear canal and finally hits a structure called your eardrum, it's going through air. And there's air behind the eardrum, and then there's fluid inside this third part. So the, the, the ear itself has three parts. First two are air, and the third is fluid-filled. Now the second part contains this structure called ossicles, which we'll go over. They're bones that transmit movement from this bigger eardrum to the smaller window over here. And finally, we get to the inner ear, and it's full of fluid, and it contains this snail-like su su structure, um, and it's called the cochlea. And all on this within the snail like structure um, you have this ribbon coming along here and that's called the basilar membrane it's yellow here and you can see that it has this odd shape the the the, the structure of this snail like structure thing is wider here okay and thinner thinner as you go around but this ribbon it's called the basilar membrane, gets thicker as it goes around. Okay. So something that you wouldn't expect. Now, what we've done here is unrolled the bas this, this snail-like structure. And you can see here is the uh, basilar membrane. And you can see it's thin at this end and thicker at this other end. And we'll see the significance of that change in thickness uh, later in this lecture. What we'll concentrate on now is this middle part, the middle ear. And we'll look at the structure of these things called the ossicles. There are three bones, this one, this one, and this little one. And as you see in the in the diagram and in, the, in, in this animation, when this thing pushes, it pushes this. Okay, so why have this? Well, one of the main reasons for having this is that if you have air in here and you have water here, so air you could think of as this small little ball and water you can think of as these, these made up of these big little ball big ball balls not little and if this t tiny molecule were to hit this big molecule it would just bounce off it's like p playing billiards and instead of a billiard ball you had a let's say a ping pong ball you wouldn't move the billiard ball by much okay so what 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 these ossicles do is they act like a lever system. Okay. A lever system is like the thing you look you use to lift up your car when you have a flat. Okay. Little old you can manage to lift a big heavy car because you've got this lever. Well s s the same thing happens here. This forms a lever. And it forms a lever in several ways, one of which is just the shape of this is lever-like. But the other thing is that this is a, a big ear drum, and this is a little much smaller drum. So it's concentrating all this force onto this tiny little area. Okay. So as a consequence, then, we can move these, these big molecules. The other thing that, that happens is that attached 
to these ossicles is a muscle that can get, be contracted either two ways, one of which is your brain can, can, can initiate a contraction of this. And surprisingly, it does so every, before every, you speak. So every time I speak now, I contract this muscle here, and it helps protect the hairs in my uh, ba on my basilar membrane. You'll we'll see, we'll see in a moment, this basilar membrane is covered with tiny little hairs, and these are very important for hearing. The other thing it does is it reflexively uh, contracts whenever you enter a loud environment or you turn up turn something up like a, the, the volume on your headphones um, and uh, they're too loud for your system and it contracts these ossicles. Okay, so we'll go further into what happens. Now this, this first uh, little um, diaphragm um, is, is is on the, a window called the oval window. There's another little um, diaphragm below it called the round window. And this round window acts like a, an escape valve. If it wasn't here, you couldn't compress this 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 space. Think of it as a coke can. And if 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 you were to press on the fluid in the coke can, you couldn't compress it, and you couldn't push in. Okay, so this little opening here allows you to press in, and when you press in, you deflect this basilar membrane. Okay, so you need this pressure outlet. Now, when you deflect your basilar membrane, you have sitting on this membrane a structure like this. It's an amazing little structure. This is called a hair cell. And this hair cell bends every time this basilar membrane is rocked back, up and down. Okay. And it is attached to your eighth nerve, and it sends a signal down the eighth nerve to your brain. Now, what is more amazing about this structure is that sitting on top of each hair, from one hair to the next, is a little, uh, little string, tiny little string. And each string is attached to the end of the next hair. And as it bends, it opens the top of each hair, allowing potassium to flow in, and that potassium changes the potential inside the hair cell and causes it to depolarize and produce transmitter, which then gets sent to the, the, the nerve that follows. Okay, so I think this is an amazing structure. You've got a, a microscopic, tiny little hair cell. It's, you know, you can't see it. You need a microscope to be able to see it. And on each hair of this microscopic hair cell, you've got a little flap opening up, up and down. And it's attached by these even more microscopic little hairs. Um, for this, these hairs were not seen until the, the, the late 50s because we didn't have microscopes strong enough to be able to image them. But that also gives you a clue that this is a very sensitive structure, okay? These are tiny little hairs and easily damaged. And so it's important not to subject yourself to a loud environment, either by entering it, like some of these uh, bars have music that plays awfully loud. And um, I've noticed some people walking around with earphones 
set, set extremely high. So take care. These, th these once once a hair cell is broken, it's broken for life. You can't fix it. Okay. Well, we 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 bend this hair cell, and then what happens? Well, it forms a wave that travels down this basilar membrane. So it starts up over here at this end and goes down to the other end. And as it travels, it gets bigger and then it gets smaller. Now, this is where the fact that the basilar membrane is thin at one end and thick at the other comes to, into play. What your basilar membrane is, it is like a piano. Okay, Think of this as the tight strings, small tight strings on your piano, and these as the loose strings on your piano, the big, the big strings. Okay? So it's thin here, small strings, thick here, big strings. So these are the low notes. These are the high notes. So for this basal membrane, we'll hit a peak here for the uh, high note and here for the note you haven't heard before because for some reason my, uh, my, my speaker here can't hit those low notes. It's not producing the low notes. The system here is not very, very good. Okay. Um, now, you heard a tune there, okay? You, the amazing thing is that you all heard this tune not because your hair cell was firing at a certain frequency, but it was which hair cell was activated. You had three groups of hair cells being activated because there's only three notes being played here. And it was because this group fired, and then this group fired, and then this group fired, that you heard these different notes. So what frequency is, is you're hearing is dependent not on uh, how fast how many action potentials are being produced, but which one is active. So it's like the labeled line of touch, you know, which afferent is being activated is important. But instead of having just four types of lab labeled lines, here we have something like 16,000 hair cells, giving you the opportunity to hear about 16,000 different frequencies. What you saw here was loud and soft, okay? And what happened was in one case, the basilar membrane was displaced a lot, and the other case, just a little. In turn, here, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the basilar membrane rocked back and forth a lot, and so you had a big displacement of those hairs, and producing a large change in frequency. And in case of a soft sound, you just have a little displacement of the hairs using a small change in frequency. Okay. So the, how loud a sound is, is dependent on the frequency. Okay. The loudness is signaled by frequency. Which frequency is signaled by which hair cell? So, if you hear a complex sound, there's lots of things going on in there. Lots of frequencies, lots of different uh, levels of sound for each frequency. So all the hair, there are many, you know, you know, these 16,000 hair cells that are firing here. And you can think of each one as one of these bars on this synthesizer. I don't know if you've seen a synthesizer 
on your computer. Uh, but basically, they show the frequencies along here, so different frequencies. And then the level here is how loud that particular frequency is. So this is doing the same thing. It's acting like, like a synthesizer. These are how much, how loud this frequency is. This is how loud this frequency is. And so when you hear a complex tune like that, it is all that being broken, all those frequencies that allowed it being analyzed by this basilar membrane and the hair cells on it. Okay, well, this thing can get damaged. An extremely loud sound, like a, um, an explosion, um, can cause, first of all, your eardrum to break, the, the, the ossicles to break, the basilar membrane to break. Less loud sounds can shear the hairs on your hair cells. Now, if you're if you're in a in a rock band um, and you've been in the rock band for some time, um, you this is what happens to your hair cells, and it it, it is frequency dependent. So, the hairs on a certain portion of your basilar membrane will disappear, and it's the I think it's the low frequency sounds that, that tend to disappear the most because the bass drums are uh, put, put on extra loud. The other thing that can ha happen is that you can have an infection. And when an infection occurs, it fills this middle ear. Okay. And as a consequence then, any air, uh, any sound wave that comes, hits this uh, water and immediately bounces off and sort of um, short circuits the function of those ossicles and your hearing becomes affected. When, of course, you go swimming, water tends to fill this canal here and then it bounces off even before it reaches the eardrum you have trouble hearing when you step out of a pool sometime. The other thing that happens is that when, 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 as these flaps open, they're just mechanical openings in a tube. And even though they're microscopic in size, particles can enter it. It's, it doesn't matter if you're a potassium ion or some sort of other molecule. And um, what happened was an antibiotics, forms of antibiotics, would start producing deafness in people before they figured out how to, which antibiotics worked and which ones didn't. And um, that produced a hearing loss. And of course, finally, old age. Uh, I don't know if you can hear a creaking sound from where you are, but. Um, that is what symbolizes old age. And what, what happens is, it, you know, changes in blood supply uh, will wear out the hair cells, uh, wear out the, the stiffness of the eardrums, and many other things in life. Okay. Um, I'm going to have... So, let's see how the how the... How the auditory, what, 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 how it compares your two years. <laughs> now, if we had a stereo speaker here, you'd be able to hear the sound coming from one side of the room or the other side of the room. But we don't have a stereo speaker here. So the fact that you don't hear it moving from side to side of the room, don't worry about it. But at home, if you have stereo speakers and you play the same thing, you'll be able to hear that, that changing from side to side. Now, so these are relatively 
high frequency sounds. Okay? And you can see that when the sound comes from this side, let's say, it forms a shadow here. And so this ear gets a louder sound than this ear. Okay. Now, this works best for low frequency sounds, for high frequency sounds, because low frequency sounds will tend to wrap around the head and, and make both ears sound more of the same. So, it's the fact that the head forms a shadow that allows you to hear differently from one ear to the other ear. That's one difference. The other difference is when you hear um, timing differences. Now, it's, this, this measure of timing difference is truly amazing. Now, this is slowed down many, 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 many fold, okay? This is a, a way of going by your head, and it's hitting one ear first and the other ear second. But this happens in real life in something like 10 one millionth of a second. Your brain is able to <coughs> measure that, okay? It means that this ear is about a million, comes about a million, ten millionths of a second before this ear. Okay. And one of the things that allow it to do that is those little hair cells and the flap that opens. If you didn't have this mechanical thing that opens, and for that reason, those occur fast. Uh, you wouldn't be able to hear such small differences in timing. Again, this works best for certain frequencies of sound. Okay? And these timing differences occur best for low frequency sounds. If you have high frequency sounds, you could have many waves passing by the head at the same time, and the brain can't tell which one, is, which difference is measuring at any moment. Yes? Know that producing an action potential, an action potential travels down the eighth nerve, and the structures downstream can somehow detect differences of that. So an action potential will travel down from one ear to your brain and another ear to your brain, and and the, the brain can measure that one action potential is that much sooner than the other action potential. The, 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 because of the flaps that, that allow this potassium to flow in very suddenly uh, with very little delay. Um, whereas um, if it was through um, uh, something like a receptor, um, like the receptors in your um, uh, touch receptors, it, 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 it'll tell, yeah, or some sort of cascade system you know, that you have in your eye. That, those, those kind of differences would be sort of blurred out. Okay. And in addition, you can, the, the shape of the earlobe, we have these funny earlobes, and that helps us determine where the sound is coming from your ears direct sound from the front um, more loudly, okay? So they pick up things in, in the forward direction. Also, there's little funny sort of things within your earlobe 
they serve a function. They produce little echoes. So the sounds come in one way, then bounce this way, then bounce that way, and finally into your ear. And these little echoes can help you determine whether the sound is coming above or below you. Um, the other way is that you can turn your head to wherever sound is coming from. And if you turn your head towards the sound, then of course you'll, you'll hear it equally in both ears and know that it's directly in front of you, wherever you're looking at. Vision is, is really important, uh, as we'll see later, in um, telling us what, what a sound is. And, and the visual system uh, captures sometimes the sound. Uh, or the sound source. So ventriloquist moves a mouth over here and speaks from over here, and you think because this mouth is moving over here that it's the source of the sound. Um, a lot of times when you're watching a movie, um, you hear a mouth, you see a mouth move, and you get the impression that that's where the sound is coming from. Okay, so where is it that uh, this timing difference is measured or this loudness difference is measured? It's measured in the structure called the superior olivary nucleus or the superior olive. And it has, so the ear from one sound, one, one ear that comes this way and this, the, the acupensils from the other ear, cross over and meet in this olivary nucleus. Now, there's an anatomically mirror image on this side, okay? It's not everything's coming from this side. There's another olivary nucleus on this side, and it gets the, the mirror image of this diagram. Okay. So, there, within the olivary nucleus, there are two parts. There's a lateral part and a superior part. And the lateral support part measures the differences in sound intensity. The medial part measures the differences in timing. Now from there, sound travels first to the inferior colliculus. So we talked about the superior colliculus. The superior colliculus is what, what activates the visual grasp reflex. So when we um, see something off on our, our periphery, we look towards it. And whether we turn our eyes or our eyes and our heads towards the object. Similarly, when we hear something, it's the inferior colliculus that is receiving the sound, and then it projects to the superior colliculus, and you look towards the sound. Now, from there, the, the information travels to the thalamus, in this case, the medial geniculate part of the thalamus, and then to the primary auditory cortex, and we'll see what goes on in there in a moment, but this is where the, your first inkling of the conscious perception of the sound occurs. Now, a little quiz. What's this? Okay. So you can see here that this is five milliseconds. Uh, so Five milliseconds is five one thousandths of a second. So, what is this? What kind? It's a sound. Okay. And what kind of sound is it? Is it five similar sounds played every millisecond? As there's one, two, three, five of these. Okay. Is it five? We'll, we'll, we can you can pick tables anytime you're ready. Okay. Is it five sounds? of an increasing frequency I played. Oh, I see people w wishing to 
for the table. Okay. Five sounds of an increasing intensity are played. Oh, I hear more, more convincing hits of the table. I see one sound of a thousand hertz is played. A little bit, but, but not too convincing. Five sounds are played while you're shifting your head um, from left to right. Good. That would be my choice. And this one. Okay. So, this is, you know, you're recording from something here, but it's the same thing. So, it's, it's not different frequencies, because, or increasing frequencies, because this thing doesn't code frequency. Um, loudness codes for, is coded by frequency, so it could be a soft sound, and this is a loud sound. Or be, you could be turning your head. This is a sound that's coming from the right, and you're turning. Here you have the, the uh, you, you're on the left, and now you're gradually turning toward, towards the right and becoming louder in, in the ear that's that is being turned in that direction. Okay. Primary auditory cortex. This is this part here, and it's located here on the temporal lobe. And it's mostly hidden in here in this thing called the sylvian um, or lateral fissure. And this is it blown up. And here you can see the basilar membrane with the low frequency, high frequency part of it. I'm not sure why it drew this way, but it would be the other way around in terms of um, like a piano. But anyways, um, it, this is the right end. This low frequency, end. this is the high frequency. End. I'm just a little confused as to why I made it thicker at this point. Anyways, um, so you find columns again in this this primary auditory cortex and you have um, high frequency sounds that laid up these columns and low frequency sounds that laid up these columns. Now so this is primary auditory cortex, it's called A1. And every sound will activate that region. Around it is another region called, surprisingly, A2. And here, this A2 surprisingly light, lights word-like sounds. So something that could be a word. And we'll see in a moment that there are sounds called, called like ba, ga, r, l that are called phonics. Okay, and they form the parts of words. And so this this is tuned to not words yet, but the parts of words. So a one is is also called the and A2 is called the belt because it forms a ring around it. And within these, these two areas, you have, um, like in the visual, primary visual, V1, V2, V3, you have this mirror imaging. Okay? Well, you have, here you have mirror imaging of this basilar membrane. Okay? Um, it flips from, from region to region. And you don't have just two regions or three regions. Here you have something like about a dozen and growing number of regions as, as our imagers get sharper and sharper. Behind A2, 
over here in, in the temple lobe is something called Wernicke's area. And here is where the parts words get put together into whole words. This part is important for word comprehension. Now, we'll talk a little bit about phonics because they're interesting. Newborns, everywhere <laughs> in the world, okay? A child is born, every baby in the world hears the same set of, set of phonics. Okay? Surprising. So we're all born citizens of the world. Well, this lady called Patricia Kuhl, uh, there's a video of her in the links of this, uh, uh, of this lecture. Um, she found that after the age of six, uh, six months, their auditory system starts to filter. And it filters for familiar phonics. Okay. So you start to hear the familiar ones that are part of your language better and ones that are outside of your language, poor or not at all. Okay? So you're losing your ch children as they grow from newborn to six months, start losing the ability to hear phonemes unless they're in their environment. Ah, ah. So what did you see there? Okay, we'll play this again. What what happens? You have a, a pacifier. You can hear it beep each time. If the child falls asleep, you can't hear anything. As, whenever the phonem changes, the baby starts sucking. Okay? The baby notices this change in phonem from ba to whatever it was, to pa. Ba pa. Should you try it? Ba pa. Just a little tiny change in where your lips are determine the sound difference. Yes. Now, so, what did this Peter Amos went around and found this ability. You know, you take a baby, you put a little bit of electronics in the pacifier, and you record it. And so what Patricia Kuhl did and her students, they recorded every possible phoneme they could gather from every language onto a tape recorder, and then went around the world with these pacifiers, and they could tell when the baby could hear the difference and when it couldn't. And so they found that things changed at about six months. I think it's a neat story. So when we're raised in, in an English environment, we hear L's and we hear R's and we develop this this filter, okay? So every, again, try an R and an L, you're just moving your tongue back and forth. If you move it somewhere in the middle, it sounds more like one or the other, but not something in between. So this, this filter is either making whatever you're hearing, an L or an R, and, and making it sound like this familiar sound. Now, if you're born in an environment that, which, like Japanese, in which R's and L's are not produced in that environment, then R, all your R's and L's are grouped in, into the same phoneme, and you don't hear differences between them. <coughs> So, let's look at sort of the sequence of activity that could occur in your brain when you're, like me here, trying to read out loud. 
from my screen. So, um, the words enter through my eye and go to the primary visual cortex of the higher order areas where I start detecting the lines here, this edge of the R, that, that roundness in the R, and so forth. From there, information goes, as you may recall, to this thing called the visual word form area. Now remember you have an FFA that's primarily on the right side, used to detect which, which face it is, whose face it is. Is it a familiar face? Is it a stranger's face? Well, the, the posterior end of the FFA on the left side starts being taken over for language, for words, visual words. Okay. So, not, not words that we hear, but words that we see. Uh, so you can think of words as faces, and that's why this structure, the FFA, is being taken over, because they're, they're complex little things, and you have to distinguish between one and the other, and you have to distinguish it quickly. You recognize words as holes. Okay? Sometimes you have a difficulty in figuring out what the word is. You'll sound it out. But when you read, you read whole words not letter by letter. Now, the reason it's taken over the left side is because the left side is your language area, at least in most people. Now, I'm not sure what happens when language is on the left, but the visual form area switches sides and FFA switches sides. That answer I don't know and I should know. I'll look that up. Yes? No, they they will recognize faces. Yes. Um. I think if they have a lesion on the right FFA, they will have difficulty recognizing the faces. Well, I w maybe some very dramatic differences in faces, but for the most part, they will not be able to recognize faces. And equally, if you lose your word form area, you lose the ability to read, and on the left side. So there are stories of people that become authors, okay, write books, lose their visual word form area. They can still write, but they can't read what they've written. So they have to have a friend or colleague read to them what what they've written, either by handwriting or by typing. It's amazing. So the people that have this problem are, have dyslexia, a reading disability. And I got interested in this area, oh, about 10 years ago, when, uh, well, no less than 10, five years ago, when one of my granddaughters was diagnosed with dyslexia, I decided, Maybe I want to study it some more, and I've written a few papers about it. So, from there, information flows from the visual word form area to your PTO. Um, and this is where, again, integration with other modalities take place. And uh, um, if you're seeing an apple, uh, you can recognize it also in terms of touching the apple, um, you can, uh, the sound of the apple being spoken will, will activate this area, and touching an apple will also activate this area. And of course, tasting an apple will do so. 
from there, information flows, if you're going to read this thing out loud, to the vertices area, where the, the, um, the verbal understanding is, occurs. And um, again, so this area is important for integrating a little, uh, much of what this part does, vertices does as well. You integrate reading, hearing words, reading words, or touching braille. This area is also important for getting information about biological motion. Remember, um, from from your um, from your area that measures MT and M M MST information flows to um, the superior temporal lobe and to this area. And it's there that you do your lip reading. Okay? When you're lip reading, you're using this area for lip reading. Um, I don't think I can click on this. Well, let's see. Huh. Nope. Okay, not available. Um, I'll I'll try to find this link for you again because it's very interesting. Um, on it, what what is what is shown is how much what you see changes what you hear. Okay, just uh, the 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 picture of something going. Ba 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 can make it sound like um, can change the sound of pa to ba just by the way your lips look. Okay. So you can be on you can see a face that's saying pa 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 another one face over here saying ba 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 and as you look from face to face the sound changes even though the same sound is being produced by both faces, or no, uh, uh, yeah, at the same time, being used by both faces. So, um, from there, information for, for, for goes to another very important area called Broca's area, and it's here that verbal expression occurs. This is part of your frontal lobe, okay, and this is part that you have working memories. And if you're going to say something, you have to say something grammatically correct. So you've got to come up with a whole sentence before you open your mouth. And you need working memory to form a sentence. Okay? You've got to get all the words in the right order. So from there, you go to the facial motor area and then contract the right muscles to speak, the, 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 the many muscles to activate, the muscles of your lips, tongue, and also your lungs to project sounds at the right uh, pitch and right um, loudness. Now, if you have lesions of these areas, um, some of these areas, some interesting things happen. When you have a lesion of vertices area, then you cannot understand like spoken language, at least not the, um, the sounds of the language. But you can say words. Okay? Um, and sometimes the word Words are nonsense words. When you have a lesion of Broca's areas, um, you cannot say the right word, especially not the right grammar. It comes, you know, the word order becomes wrong. But you can still, because this area is done, understand language. So this becomes very frustrating, okay? Because this patient can 
hear himself speak, but because he's got this this lesion, he, he so he can express words, he knows what he wants to say, and he can hear what he's saying, the words that he's saying, and he can hear them coming out all wrong because of damage in Broca's area. On the other hand, if you had a lesion in, in, in Wernicke's area, you wouldn't be able to hear that you're speaking with in the wrong order or the, the wrong, lo, wrong word. Yes. Well, largely because they, they, they have uh, trouble um, articulating each word. Uh, so, um, yes, coming up with the sounds of the word. Yes. Pardon me? I'm, is, if you could, I, um, so what, what words, he, um, it might not, not be the, um, the correct word for whatever object he wants to, um, describe. So the, it might, he wants to describe a pencil and he says a pen or something like that. That's right. Right. Yes. No, but they can't form the sentence. No, no. So they, they, that's why the grammar is wrong because they don't have. Because the, they can hear it. Yes. No, but you could you could lose this at a later age, at a late age, or as an adult, and you could understand language before that. But because you've lost this area, you lose the understanding of what is being spoken. You, why can't you? Well, you have got to, you have a, um, like um, th this, this thing um, called lesion, you know? You have, you can't form the sounds of this word that you want to say. L you know, lesion is, is has to produce a certain sound. And you can't come up with that sound because you've lost this, this lesion, this area. Verdict again. So, when you got this lesion, the words will come out, but they'll be the wrong words for, you know, the, 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 there's a good um, a link on the, on, again, on the, on the website with a lesion of Wernicke's and a lesion of Broca's. Just listen to these two patients and you'll hear the differences between them. Okay. Now, interesting enough, American Sign Language is used by people that are deaf. Okay. So instead of um, um, speaking, um, they produce words and sentences by moving their hands and making gestures. Okay. So rather than, than things coming out of your vocal cords is these is these gestures that occur.
What's interesting is that the, if you have a lesion of Broca's, you have um, deficits in expression. You can, again, come up with a series of gestures that form a, a meaningful sentence. Um, whereas if, if you have a lesion of Wernicke's, you have deficit in the comprehension of gestures. So when someone gestures to you, you won't understand their meaning. So it looks like these these areas are just not, not you know, specialized to, to the understanding of sounds, but to gestures as well. Now, the final thing that, and it's somewhat a little bit confusing, is that there's a what and a where stream. There's a what stream that goes in the anterior direction, and again heads for Broca's area because that's where you finally want to express things. Another stream that heads back and forms a where stream, and this too ends up in 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 Broca's area. Um, this this what stream? Um, so go, goes in ends up in the prefrontal lobe, and um, this pathway, this one here, is more used for the identity of the sound. So, is, is whose voice is it? Is it your wife's voice, uh, your brother's voice? Um, whereas this side is more interested in what your brother is saying. Um, again, it's hard to sort of tack that on to uh, your other sort of what and where streams because uh, understanding what your brother is saying sounds like a what property. The where stream, again, it's, it's, it, 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 it determines sound location, but also its temporal properties, and from its temporal properties, you're figuring out what the word is that he said. And babbling is part of all this. Anyways, um, that's it for today.